Yes, Producer Grooge? Larson! I need another video before Christmas. I can't. We're flying out to the Himalayas for two weeks and then ten days in beautiful Duluth, Minnesota. You know I can't miss Duluth. Yeah, well, I'm broke. Again. I spent all my money on Laserdisc and boutique Blu-rays of obscure horror movies. And that good-for-nothing gamer David is never gonna finish that pinball machine video. But Duluth! Look, if you can't get this done, I'll find somebody who can. There's plenty of other Dans in the sea. Okay, fine. And make sure it's sponsored. Papa needs a new 4K player. I accidentally threw macaroni and cheese on mine on purpose. Hi, Pixel Dan? It's Producer Grooge. Look, you got this. Good night. Oh. Nice. In the aftermath of World War II, an international partnership was born that changed the television animation landscape. It introduced characters and adventures that continue to influence artists today. It redefined what Christmas can be and how people around the world, regardless of religious affiliation, can celebrate the season and the spirit. Hi, I'm Dan Larson, and this is the History of Rankin Bass. Thank you to 80stees.com for sponsoring this video. Click the link in the description below and use code TOYGALAXY to get 30% off your order today. 80stees.com started off as the source for t-shirts inspired by all things pop culture from the 1980s, but there's more to the 80s than just the 80s. They've got shirts inspired by the 70s, the decade that paved the way for the 80s. They've got shirts inspired by the 90s, the decade that carried on the legacy of the 80s. They've got shirts inspired by the 2000s because the 80s isn't just a decade, it's a state of mind. Whether your interests are laser focused on one thing, say movies, there's plenty of choices from Jaws to Shaun of the Dead. If your interests bounce around, they've got shirts from cartoons to video games, superheroes, to music and wrestling. It's the holiday season, and if you're up against that hard deadline, if you're not sure exactly what shirt to get, 80stees.com has gift cards available to make sure that the final gift is the right gift. From $10 and up, get a digital code emailed right to you. Click the link below and use code TOYGALAXY for 30% off your order today. Again, that's code TOYGALAXY for 30% off your order. Thanks again to 80stees.com. Rankin Bass is a media production company responsible for some of the most popular, most beloved animated television series and specials of all time. Since the 1960s, they've been synonymous with animated puppets Christmas, Lord of the Rings, and the Thundercats.
Arthur Rankin Jr. was born in 1924. He served four years in the U.S. Navy during World War II. In 1948, three years after the war ended, Rankin moved to New York City, where he began working for ABC Television as a graphic designer and eventually art director. That same year, Jules Bass moved to New York to study at New York University. He graduated in 1952 and began working at Gardner Advertising Agency. He worked his way up the ranks and within a few years was named director of radio and television. While across the state, Arthur Rankin left ABC to start his own studio. A few years after that, their paths converged and they became close friends and even closer business partners, with Bass eventually leaving Gardner to join Rankin's studio. Bass's advertising savvy complemented Rankin's already prolific experience in television program design and production. Together they formed Videocraft International, itself in the business of making TV commercials. In 1958, Arthur Rankin met with some Japanese business representatives who recommended he go to Japan to meet with director and animator Tadahito Mochinaga to learn about some of the techniques he developed and the way he was making films. Tadahito Mochinaga was animating and directing films in Japan after a life of creating art during war. He got his start during World War II making propaganda films for the Japanese government. One of his earliest credits was creating backgrounds for a 1943 film called Momotaro's Sea Eagles. It depicts the heroes from a traditional Japanese folktale as the naval aviators heading out to conquer the enemy, which in this case was the bombing of Pearl Harbor. The fictional character Momotaro and his story are well known to Japanese children. Sent by the gods, he was born from inside a peach to a couple with no children of their own. One day he sets out to conquer the demons who terrorize his village by journeying to their home on Demon Island. Along the way, a dog, a monkey, and a pheasant all join his quest. They defeat the demons, take the demon leader prisoner, and bring back all the plundered treasure. Just like the characters in the fairy tale, Momotaro Sea Eagles depicts the returning aviators of the Pearl Harbor mission as great heroes. Mochinaga regretted the work he did on those early propaganda films due to the influence they likely had on the young people who saw them, saying, quote, I heard that many youths volunteered for the Flying Corps and that while they were on duty, they died on air raids. I wonder whether the film we made influenced their decision to volunteer. I thought in the future, I only wished to make a film that would benefit the young, difficult though that might be, end quote. When World War II ended, Mochinaga fled to China, where he once again found himself creating art during war as the nationalists battled the communists, and once again making propaganda films. He spent the next decade developing new techniques for stop-motion animation using puppets in an effort to save money and resources. When he returned to Japan in 1954, he continued refining his animation process, producing films and developing young animators. When Arthur Rankin visited in 1958, the timing was perfect. Mochinaga's studio had recently closed because despite him being a master of his craft, he wasn't making enough money to sustain the work. Mochinaga had concerns about the integrity of his art form being utilized by American filmmakers, but at the end of the day, he had concerns about the bills getting paid and Rankin Bass were prepared to pay them. The result was a commission to produce a new American television show for Rankin Bass called The New Adventures of Pinocchio. Rankin and Bass were ready to move on from commercials and into full-time animation production. With Mochinaga as a partner, they released The New Adventures of Pinocchio in 1961 alongside a traditional cell animated series produced by Crawley Films called Tales of the Wizard of Oz. Rankin Bass dubbed Mochinaga's poseable puppet-based stop-motion animation Animagic, and while it wasn't the first stop-motion animation on television, it was fundamentally different from what audiences had seen previously. Producer-director George Pal had been working in his proprietary Puppetoons style since the 1940s, Art Clokey had been producing Gumby since the 1950s, and Davy and Goliath had just begun airing. The difference with Animagic was the utility of an individual puppet. Of an individual puppet. That's how it's said, right? In an, of an... In of an individual puppet. <laughs> I'm going with it. Okay. <laughs> puppet tunes were thousands of nearly identical sculptures swapped out for each frame of movement. Gumby, Davy, and Goliath were claymation. Animagic were puppets with articulation built in and swappable eye and mouth movements. In 1962, Rankin Bass began development on a television special for the General Electric Fantasy Hour. Inspired by the 1949 hit song Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer, written by Johnny Marks, performed by Gene Autry. They picked Rudolph, at least in part, because Rankin happened to live in the same neighborhood as songwriter and composer Johnny Marks. Marks's brother-in-law, Robert May, was the guy that wrote the original 1939 story commissioned by Montgomery Ward, which the song was based on. Rankin Bass's Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer was the second time the song was adapted into animation. The first was from 1948, the year before Johnny Marks's and Gene Autry's version, produced by Max Fleischer. It was based on the original story by May, as opposed to the song by Marks. 
General Electric sponsored the Rankin Bass television special and just happened to have invented the red light bulb that is featured so prominently on the title character's face. Romeo Muller wrote the screenplay. Burl Ives' character Sam the Snowman was added just before production ended through a request by NBC and GE to add a big name to the cast. The Animagic animation was produced through an international collaborative process. In New York, Rankin and the other artists would create storyboards from the script, then pass that off to Tadahito Tad Mochinaga and his studio Mom Productions in Tokyo. We here in the future know that Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer was a hit. And not just any hit, but the kind of hit that makes an audience hunger for more, year after year, resulting in a sprawling, shared universe of characters and stories, fueling the production company to grow and reach out into other storytelling ventures. And inspiring other production companies to do the same. In 1965, one year after Rankin Bass's Rudolph aired, United Features produced A Charlie Brown Christmas. The year after that, MGM made How the Grinch Stole Christmas, perennial favorites nearly 60 years later. Make way for one of America's favorite characters. Can one tiny reindeer save the day on a stormy Christmas Eve? The original Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer. Then the excitement begins with special guest star Kirk Douglas and dozens of celebrities in the 12th Annual Circus of the Stars, Tuesday. After the success of Rudolph, Rankin-Bass settled into a ruthless production machine. Year after year, creating new specials and new series, Arthur Rankin Jr. making sure the productions were sold to networks, finished, and delivered on time. Jules Bass, with his sleeves rolled up, helping compose music alongside Maury Laws, both Rankin and Bass getting credit for producing and directing over their decades in business together. Rankin-Bass Animagic series and films included things like 1965's Willie McBean and His Magic Machine, 1966's The Ballad of Smokey the Bear, 1967's Mad Monster Party, and 1968's The Little Drummer Boy. Mad Monster Party marked an end to the collaboration with Mochinaga himself as he left Mom Productions to return to filmmaking in China. Mom's successor, Video Tokyo Productions, was essentially the same Mom studio run by the people who were already working there. After officially changing their name from Videocraft International to Rankin Bass Productions, they soared into the 70s with Santa Claus is Coming to Town, Here Comes Peter Cottontail, and The Year Without a Santa Claus. Rankin Bass were a well-rounded production attacking animated entertainment from multiple angles. They took on traditional cell animation with shows like King Kong, The Mouse on the Mayflower, Frosty the Snowman, Mad 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 Monsters, Willie Mays and the Say Hey Kid, and Twas the Night Before Christmas. We should have done a deal with it gag with the Santa hat and beard. <laughs> Along with Video Tokyo Productions, Rankin Bass commissioned animation through Japanese studios like Toei, TCJ, Mushi Productions, and Topcraft, studios that employed some of the greatest animators alive at the time and developed the talent that would create some of the greatest animation of the future. They continued to produce Animagic with Rudolph's Shiny New Year, The Easter Bunny is Coming to Town, Nestor the Long-Eared Christmas Donkey, Rudolph and Frosty's Christmas in July, and Jack Frost. In 1977, Rankin Bass leapt into fantasy adventure adapting The Hobbit, with some familiar names in the credits like Romeo Muller, who was responsible for writing the overwhelming majority of Rankin Bass productions, and Mari Laws, who composed the majority of the Rankin Bass music. With a $3 million budget, it aired on NBC television to mixed reviews. Despite Rankin Bass's intention to remain as true to the source material as possible, some called it confusing, some called it an abomination, others merely bemoaned the loss of certain plot lines. That said, it was nominated for a Hugo Award, but lost to Star Wars. It would have to settle as the introduction point for a whole new generation of Lord of the Rings fans who would discover the books and sort out the details for themselves. Rankin Bass followed The Hobbit with The Return of the King three years later, skipping Fellowship and Two Towers, not because Ralph Bakshi was already exploring those stories in a completely separate animated production due to rights questions that would confuse audiences for the rest of time, but because they had always intended to omit those parts, focusing on the beginning and end of the story. In 1982, Rankin Bass adapted the book The Last Unicorn, only their fifth feature film release after two decades in animation, and in 1985 produced Thundercats, one of the marquee properties of the unregulated children's television era in the U.S. <laughs> Thundercats was supported by all manner of licensed merchandise, as was the style at the time, not the least of which were action figures. 130 episodes over four seasons from 1985 to 1989, it spawned two sister series with 1986's Silverhawks and 1987's The Comic Strip featuring Tiger Sharks, all shows we have previously covered here. 1985 also saw the last Rankin-Bass stop-motion animagic production, The Life and Adventures of Santa Claus. Inspired by the 1902 book written by Wizard of Oz author L. Frank Baum, it's an alternate origin story for Santa Claus than the previous 
hideous origin story they told in 1970's Santa Claus is Coming to Town. By the end of 1989, Rankin-Bass had already closed down its production company, and after four seasons of Thundercats and everything else they produced over their 30 years together, both Rankin and Bass were ready for a break. In 1990, they parted ways, but their corporate offices technically never closed, and neither technically stopped working completely. Arthur Rankin was back at it when he partnered with Morgan Creek Productions and Nest Family Entertainment for an animated adaptation of the Rodgers and Hammerstein Broadway musical The King and I. Released in 1999, it starred Miranda Richardson as Anna, Martine Vidnovic as the King of Siam, Daryl Hammond as Master Little, and Frank Ware's Waldo Welker as Rama, Tusker, and Moonshi. It was distributed by Warner Brothers Pictures and died at the box office, making only $12 million against a budget of around $25 million. Some critics took issue with its racial stereotypes. Others thought it took too many liberties with the subject matter. Roger Ebert gave it two out of four stars, applauding the experiment while recognizing its failure. Two years later, in 2001, Rankin and Bass reunited for Santa Baby, a traditionally animated Christmas special inspired by the 1953 song, originally performed by Eartha Kitt. It starred Patti LaBelle, Eartha Kitt, Gregory Hines, and Vanessa Williams. It marked the final production that Rankin Bass was responsible for and the last time that Rankin and Bass worked on a project together. Depending on which Rankin-Bass property we're talking about, there are lots of examples of licensed merchandise. Plenty of Thunderhawks and Silvercats. Silvercats? What the f***? Thunderhawks and Silvercats? That was my 80s brain just going like, I don't know what we're talking about anymore. <laughs> Depending on which Rankin-Bass property we're talking about, there are lots of examples of licensed merchandise. Plenty of Thundercats and Silverhawks, but very little for Rudolph and the other Animagic properties. In the late 90s, CBS released a series of Beanie Babyish plush dolls that tapped into a pop culture re-emergence of the Rankin-Bass stop-motion holiday specials. Shortly thereafter, in the early 2000s, Playing Mantis released a full line of action figures featuring the characters from Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer. In 2002, Palisades released action figures from The Year Without a Santa Claus, while NECA released a variety of plush dolls. In 2004, Playing Mantis attempted to recreate their Rudolph success with a line inspired by Santa Claus is Coming to Town. But according to Blake Wright in issue 2 of Toy Collector Magazine released in November of 2022, sales were lackluster and the line was cancelled before Wave 2 was produced. Today, all of the Rankin-Bass Christmas special inspired figures command hefty secondary market prices. There are a lot of Rankin-Bass productions. We haven't even come close to mentioning them all here. You have likely seen many of them over the years, but there are probably others that you would still like to see for yourself. Watching them on home media gets choppy because Rankin-Bass was bought, sold, and merged multiple times over their decades in business, and each time the rights to their films got a little muddier. Time for a quick round of what gives you the rights. In 1971, Rankin-Bass was purchased by Tomorrow Entertainment. At the time, Tomorrow Entertainment was a subsidiary of General Electric. Three years later, in 1974, Rankin-Bass was once again an independent production company. In 1983, Rankin-Bass was again purchased, this time by Telepictures. Three years later, Telepictures was purchased by Lorimar Productions and merged to create Lorimar Telepictures. In 1989, Lorimar Telepictures was purchased by Warner Brothers. So, what rights does that give you? That gives NBC Universal Pictures the rights to everything before 1974, including anything that was made by Videocraft International before the name officially changed to Rankin Bass. That includes Willie McBean and his Magic Machine. That gives Warner Brothers Discovery the rights to everything after 1974, with some exceptions, because it gives Studio Canal the rights to anything that was distributed through Embassy Pictures, including Mad Monster Party and the wacky world of Mother Goose. And also, it gives ITV the rights to The Last Unicorn, Morgan Creek Productions the rights to 1999's The King and I, sorry about that Morgan Creek, and 1971's 23-episode Saturday morning cartoon series Jackson 5 to CBS Media Ventures. As convoluted as that mess of current ownership is, it has not prevented the majority of the Rankin-Bass library from being enjoyed by each generation that has lived through a Christmas with a television or today streaming services and the internet. Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer has aired almost every year since it was created in 1964. Many of the Rankin-Bass holiday specials have continued to be annual viewing traditions, whether it's as part of the Family Channel's 25 Days of Christmas or AMC's Best Christmas Ever series. You may have to keep an eye on scheduling to find the airing of the special you want as these things get packaged together and moved around from subsidiary to subsidiary, cable package to cable package. A joint production between Warner Brothers and NBC Universal allowed for a release of the complete Rankin-Bass Christmas collection in October 2022, a nine-disc set that features 18 of Rankin-Bass's most popular and beloved specials. From 1964's Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer to 1985's The Life and Adventures of Santa Claus, the set includes a Rankin-Bass documentary, commentaries, behind-the-scenes, stop-motion 101, and is... 
$200 on eBay? I didn't even know this existed till just now. What am I supposed to do when my wife Kate finds out this exists and I didn't get it for her for Christmas? Wait a minute, what am I talking about? She doesn't watch this show. Rankin Bass specials have been influencing artists and creators since the 1960s, from Tim Burton's Frankenweenie and the Nightmare Before Christmas to 2010's Abed's Uncontrollable Christmas episode of Community, all produced in stop-motion animation, to 2003's Elf starring Will Ferrell as an elf raised in a world that is intentionally homaging the Rankin Bass animagic look and feel. There have been countless references in media, television parodies, stylistic homages. In 2006, The Year Without a Santa Claus got the live-action television special treatment on NBC, starring John Goodman as Santa Claus, Delta Burke as Mrs. Claus, Harvey Firestein as Heat Miser, and Michael McKeon as Snow Miser. Tadahito Mochinaga died in 1999 at 80 years old, leaving behind a legacy of animation mastery, a mentor to thousands of artists, his work loved and admired in China, Japan, the U.S., and around the world. Arthur Rankin Jr. passed in 2014 at age 89. Jules Bass was 87 when he died in October of this year, 2022. If the last 60 years in any way represent the next 60 years, then Rankin Bass Productions will continue to be loved long into the future. The name, the philosophy is synonymous with wholesome, beloved entertainment that established voices for what could have been simple marketing characters or unrelatable mythological concepts. They helped foster a vision of holidays and celebration that encouraged inclusivity and understanding, becoming a part of annual celebrations for family, friends, and fans who love animation, who love Christmas, who love the Thundercats. Thanks for watching. Please hit like, hit subscribe if you're not already a subscriber. Thank you very much to those of you who already are. If you're in the position to help the channel grow, if you would like early access to the videos ad-free, please visit our Patreon at patreon.com slash toygalaxy and let us know in the comments down below what your favorite Rankin Bass production is. I don't know that I have a favorite. I wasn't even really a Thundercats guy growing up. I love the look of The Hobbit, but I'm not sure that I've ever seen the entire thing. So I'm just gonna say Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer take a beat while the teleprompter catches up. I can get pretty jaded sometimes, but there's still plenty of room in this old heart to appreciate the wonder of that special, the animation, the music, and everything about Yukon Cornelius. From everyone here at Secret Galaxy, we wish you a Merry Christmas and a Happy Holidays. Cut.